Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually soft ahead and illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and hopefully for the next hour, they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Dr. Cuddy, are you there? Yes, sir. Well, why don't you pick up the story? For those of you who don't know Dr. Cuddy, certainly he has certainly uh, he's taught at the university level. Uh, he's uh, certainly he's worked in the Reagan administration in the Department of Education. He's been a consultant for industry. He's a prolific writer, and we carry all of the books he has that are in print at the present time. But basically, of course, he's a researcher, in my estimation, the finest researcher we have, exposing the dark and sinister spirit of forces working behind the scenes. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Well, uh, as usual, I try to give some sort of uh, comment on contemporary issues of the day before picking up with uh, where we left off in my latest, uh, well, one of my more recent uh, news with news column. We were beginning the House of Orange uh, Part 2, but a couple of issues I wanted to touch on first. Uh, the news uh, over the weekend and on the talk shows today has been about uh, Detroit uh, going bankrupt. Uh, the city of Detroit, and uh, when you when you listen to the the actual figures, it's rather remarkable. Something like 40% of the street lights uh, don't work. Uh, the response of police to a call in the Michigan in general is uh, 11 minutes, but in Detroit it's uh, up to 40 minutes where the police can, uh, res will respond to a call. Now, uh, some of that uh, is a result, but not most, uh, some of that is a result of what I would call a, a sort of domino effect. When you have a, a city, a major city, and its um, it, it economic base is geared towards a particular industry, let's say automobiles, or not necessarily the, the manufacturer, but all of the parts and and, and one thing leads to another, and suppliers, and then you have certain businesses built up around the amount of uh, people who are working at a particular plant, the, the people who are the barbers, you know, and the, the restaurant owners and so forth. It's, it's sort of a domino effect that if a major industry in anywhere uh, is hit, then everybody else is affected. Uh, for example, in the southwest part of the uh, state where I live, uh, there was a major uh, textile industry in the town, uh, Gaston County, Gastonia near Charlotte, uh, was flourishing. I mean, doing very, very well. And all of a sudden, uh, the globalists decide, well, for the benefit of all mankind, uh, we're going to have this global economy. And uh, uh, for the majority of Americans down the road, this will be a great benefit. However, I remember back in the uh, mid-'90s when NAFTA and GATT were, were being passed, they said, oh, of course, there will be certain industries which will be negatively affected, and that's the way it is. Those people can be uh, retrained, and let's move ahead. Of course, if you're in one of those cities, uh, let's move ahead isn't just you know a snap of the fingers. Uh, first of all, those people are not going to be retrained to be rocket scientists if they're in uh, what's uh, just you know basic labor jobs. Uh, and uh, secondly, when they do get retrained for something. Those jobs, if they're of any substance, will probably go overseas, too. And finally, if they wind up in service industries, uh, well, those jobs aren't going to pay anywhere near the manufacturing jobs that they had. So there's a real impact, and that's to some extent what happened to Detroit, but not entirely. Most of the problem in Detroit, which we'll get to after the break, was uh, classic mismanagement. All right, hold on. We'll be back in just a moment here with Dr. Dennis Cuddy. But Detroit has recently declared bankruptcy, and more and more of our cities are going the same way because of the globalist policies of the invisible government.
Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we're today talking about uh, the bankruptcy of Detroit and what's it going to mean. Uh, is this simply just uh, an aberration, or is this a program that we're going to see increasingly uh, as a result of the globalist policies which are transferring America's wealth and jobs overseas? And I would like to suggest that's exactly what is happening. There's an organized effort to impoverish the American people, to lower living standards here as we raise living standards throughout the world, and we have raised living standards throughout the world, but of course certainly more and more people in America now, they have to have two people working in every family, certainly more and more people on part-time work, or certainly more and more people losing their jobs, lowering living standards, the prices are going up, the salaries are not. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay, well, <clears throat> Detroit is the, the first uh, it, it's not the first city to have financial problems, but it's the first major city to be hit this way, this hard. And Detroit is, is sort of a, a precursor of things to come. And Detroit's problem is that there there is a, uh, a nexus here where you have uh, the globalist policies of sending jobs overseas, lowering living standards, as Dr. Stan just said, c- accompanied with uh, real... Uh, <laughs> I can call it corruption or whatever you want to call it, mismanagement. So those things, those two things together have made Detroit uh, descend uh, quicker than other cities, which will follow. Uh, it, it may be that you're in another particular state, in a major city, and if it's industry, let's say the you know the city of whatever uh, produces widgets, and, and the huge industry grows up around it. And because it's such a vital uh, part, uh, what you have is a stronger and stronger union movement. And in Detroit, the auto workers, you demand higher and higher wages, no more and more benefits, uh, full payment of salary after retirement, a you know great uh, you know insurance scheme till you die, and all this sort of stuff. Because the the economy of the city is sort of rolling along, you know, and you're sort of rising on this tide, and everybody's benefiting and so on. But then what happens is the globalists. Uh, see that you reach a particular level, right? And then what they can do is all of a sudden uh, it becomes uh, a case of, well, you know, the, the salaries have gotten so high that we can have widgets made uh, in Bangladesh, you know, or, or wherever. And so all of a sudden the economy is severely undercut because it's not just that the price of labor goes over there, Hold that thought, hold that thought, Dr. Cuddy. We'll be back in a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is simply pointing out that certainly in towns and municipalities and states all across America, certainly government employees are able to demand higher wages. Certainly workers are able to demand higher wages and better pensions and better benefits, and things keep getting better and better until the globalists say, well, look, we can get exactly these same things made over in Bangladesh for about a quarter or an eighth of the price, so basically we're just going to transfer the jobs over there. And then, of course, uh, why, of course, the industries begin shutting down, and then there's nobody paying taxes, and the money's not going into the municipalities, you got to start cutting back on the... Other schools are doing it all across the country. they got to start cutting back on the pensions they pay the government employees. Everybody thinks that everything is going to be fine. Are they going to retire with these wonderful benefits, health benefits and retirement benefits? But ladies and gentlemen, this whole system is bankrupt. It's morally bankrupt. It's financially bankrupt. Most of the municipalities have not put aside the money that's necessary uh, to certainly pay the pensions and that money, if it is set aside, is invention, actually invested uh, certainly in, uh, in various uh, 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 certainly bonds, and those bonds are going down as certainly as the interest rates begin to rise. Well, the bonds are going to lose their value, and the, the, the monetary backing behind so many of the pensions and the annuities and the hedge funds, and even the banks themselves, are going to begin to collapse. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, it if it was simply a case of some corporation making a business decision that rather than uh, pay workers in this, we'll call it the city X, it doesn't matter. It could be you know Phoenix or Dallas, doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, 
they're making a, a business decision that they can get cheaper labor in Bangladesh, uh, that would uh, that would be bad enough. But uh, another two things are added. To, well, three things are added to that. Number one, even though a lot of American companies have American names, they're actually owned by you know somebody in Saudi Arabia or the Netherlands or somewhere. So those people could care less about the people in Phoenix who are making the widgets or Dallas or wherever. And so it's, it's not like they have any loyalty to, you know, <laughs> to, to these people in these towns. It's simply a business decision. All right, that's one factor. The second factor you add to that is that apparently, and I've uh, described this many times, the cartoon will again be in my new book. Uh, it'll be out in about a week called The Power Elite, Their History and Future. I put right at the front that, that famous 1911 cartoon where these powerful people, the power lead, I call them, John D. Rockefeller, uh, J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, and so forth, are greeting Karl Marx to Wall Street. They're standing there at Wall Street, and they're saying, delighted. And what they're saying delighted about is not Karl Marx's communism or his manifesto. Under Marx's arm, if you read the title of the book, it says socialism, because those powerful people love socialism. John D. Rockefeller, uh, once upon a time, way back, said competition is a sin. He hates competition. We're, we're supposed to be a capitalist, free enterprise system based on competition and all the benefits thereof. But he hates competition. The monopoly capitalists hate competition. And so they love socialism because through socialism they can buy, virtually buy, politicians, whether at the national level, state level, local level, and then they can, uh, through their contributions and persuasion, uh, have those politicians enact rules, regulations, and laws that benefit them and stifle competition. So they, they really love socialism. And so what happens is uh, those powerful people call up, you know, U.S. Senator or whatever or whoever and say, yeah, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, I think it would be a good thing to pass a law, which they did uh, a couple of decades ago, that says we need to give an incentive to that corporation to move the widget manufacturing overseas. And so the senator says, sounds good to me, sir. And so they pass a federal law, which actually gives incentives for corporations to relocate industries and jobs in China or somewhere. Not only that, the third uh, prong in this uh, this attack is they, the powerful people, power elite, says to the senator, you know, by the way, not only should we give an incentive for them to relocate their widget factory over in China or Bangladesh, uh, tell you what, why don't we attach a little amendment to that, that uh, federal law that says if you bring the profits you make over there back here, we're going to tax you, but if you keep the profits in Bangladesh or China, we won't tax you. Uh, you know, just as a little added bonus. And so when you stack all these things on top of each other, it's no wonder that Detroit is simply the first of, of uh, unfortunately, a, a fair number of cities which are going to start to slide. Now, as I said, when all the, you know, the geniuses, Rush Limbaugh and uh, Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck, we're saying that uh, no way Barack Obama was going to be reelected. Uh, unemployment was too high, and so forth. And I said, "Oh yes, he is, because he's important to the Paralyzed plan." <laughs> As I said then, everybody says, "Oh, we're going to dive. Oh, the economy, Barack Obama. Oh, we're going in a hole in 2013." I said, "No, we're not. For 2013, and maybe into 2014, things won't be real bad. There'll be some rumbling, you know, rumbling, but come midway." say right about the time of the 2014 election, right or right after it, right after beginning 2015, then the old house of cards will, will start to tumble. And by 2016, it's going to be really tumbling. And so, you know, everybody will be disenchanted and say, oh, that awful Barack Obama and those awful Democrats supporting him, those bad people, they screwed up everything. So let's elect the wonderful Republican Jeb Bush and, and so forth. So anyway, I, I won't rehash that, but that's that's the scenario. Now, uh, what happens is you have a case in in the, in the case of Detroit where you add to all of those financial machinations that the parallel has us going through with this global economy that they've uh, constructed here for our great benefit. And uh, what you add to that is the classic sort of corruption and mismanagement. Uh, Chicago has been known as a town of great corruption, <laughs> but Detroit is, you know, not that far behind. I'll give you an example. I was just talking uh, uh, today uh, to uh, a person that Dr. Stan and I both know, 
uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Phil O'Halloran, and he's uh, he's been an emergency room physician in uh, in Michigan, I think Bloomfield Hills, and now he has his own urgent care facility that he owns and, and runs. And he's he's very good, but he also on the side uh, used to edit a publication called Relevance, very good publication about every month. It was about 12 pages, and he would literally call up like the head of NATO over in Europe and <laughs> sort of have a chat with him and then write up some, you know, fascinating, almost secret information that nobody else knew. So he keeps on top of all this. And today I was talking to him, and he was describing how he, when he was just starting out as an intern, uh, he was uh, in Detroit. He was actually in Detroit doing his internship at the, the main hospital. And he said, you know, this, this mismanagement, of Detroit goes way, way, way back. He said back then in the mid '80s, Coleman Young uh, was the the mayor of New York, and he said, "Now New York at that time was about 700,000 people, a fairly large city." And he said, "At that time, most large cities, New York City and the rest of, them, had uh, almost in every ambulance a uh, I, I forget the acronym ACSU, something like that, acute care." Uh, unit. Uh, it, it had, you know, lidocaine and resuscitation devices. You know, a person had a heart attack. It was right on the spot, right? He said in Detroit, they only had two. Two in the city of 700,000. He said, on top of that, one of the two was reserved only for Coleman Young. In other words, they only really had one because the other one did not leave the station unless Coleman Young, as Dr. O'Hallan said, uh, said, he, unless Coleman Young sneezed, you know, if Coleman Young would happen to sneeze, here comes the ambulance to save Coleman Young, the mayor. And so the rest of the people, they didn't have two. They only really had one ambulance with these. And he said people died. I mean, people literally would, you know, have a heart attack and die because they only had two, and Coleman Young was sitting on one of them. So the corruption of Detroit <laughs> matches, to some, to some extent, the uh, corruption of Chicago. So you put those two things together, and that's why you have Detroit uh, going bankrupt. I mean, it's fire trucks. Some of them are like ancient, you know. <laughs> you don't. I think uh, Doctor Howard said, "Yeah, they're running around trying to put out fires with fire with, with you know lawn hoses. You know, the little hose you use for lawn." He says, "These some of those things are really, really old, and they don't work, and so on." So the mismanagement is is massive. Uh, the only other rival to that, but it wasn't industrial based, was. Uh, I remember Washington, D.C., uh, you had uh, Marion Berry. I remember back when I was up in Washington, he had been the mayor, you know, and he got caught uh, doing doing dirty and some things. And, and I think he was also uh, getting some, uh, you know, marijuana, cocaine. And then he gets reelected. And I, I don't want to be exclusive to that because uh, my, my dad was born in 1915. And he was a young man in the, the early 30s in Boston. And he said, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, Mayor Yorty, Y-O-R-T-Y, was the mayor of Boston forever. He said, and he said, Dennis, you know, every time they catch this guy doing something illegal, and they stick him in jail over and over again, the mayor, they stick him in jail, and every time he got out, the people kept reelecting the guy <laughs> over and over again. They kept reelecting this corrupt mayor, you know, this criminal, uh, Mayor Yorty. So I, I'm not just picking on Detroit to be picking on Detroit. They, you know, like I said, Chicago and other cities, major cities, have had their their corruption. You know, and it goes back, you know, Tammany Hall and the whole thing in the, in the 1800s. But the point is, now you have this added feature. Not only do you have corruption in uh, Chicago or Detroit or Boston or New York, but you add to, to that this globalist uh, this uh, you know plot <laughs> that they've got going. To undermine the the living standards of the country, devalue the dollar, and the devalue you know, the dollar is being devalued and devalued and devalued, and so forth and so on. And it's all part of this uh, long range plan. All right, now that's enough for that comment. But something else, Doctor Stan mentioned, uh, involves schools and education. So that's the the subject I want to pick on pick up next uh, before I get to my news with views column because today, uh, Representative Joe Wilson. Uh, from South Carolina was introducing uh, the Student Success Act uh, in, uh, in Congress and how it uh, been voted on and it was going going forward. It's uh, HR five, and he said basically this is to return to, to local control and reverse George W. Bush and Ted Kennedy's No Child Left Behind. And hold that thought. Kennedy. Hold the thought. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy.
Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Okay, well, uh, picking up uh, with uh, the announcement on the national news by Representative Joe Wilson of South Carolina, he's a, a federal member of Congress, uh, the uh, Student Success Act is H.R. 5, and he was giving uh, its uh, benefits and you know, the purpose and so forth and so forth of it, and he said this is basically to reverse uh, George W. Bush and Teddy Kennedy's infamous uh, No Child Left Behind, which really took local control away from the localities in the state. Uh, for one reason, uh, you, you had to submit a plan to the U.S. Secretary of Education for his approval before you could get Title I, that's a huge chunk of money, uh, funds sent to your state. In other words, you had to get the Fed's approval before you got money, uh, a lot of money. It wasn't exclusively, but a lot of money. And so that really you know, very much undermined uh, local and state control. And so this, uh, the idea behind this bill is to reverse that. And at first that sounds fine. Okay, good, good, you know, local control, that's fine. And if any of your uh, listeners want to, to read uh, what I've written about this general subject in the past, uh, for about 10 years or so, maybe 11 years, uh, most of my articles have been online at newswithviews.com. Uh, before that, I used to have mainly print articles, articles in print. Uh, they might have been in uh, Dr. Shirley Carell's uh, Pro Family Forum or Florida Family Forum or in uh, Sarah Leslie's Christian Conscience uh, magazine. It was a really nice, glossy publication. But most of my articles prior to that were in uh, major daily newspapers. I had over uh, 30 editorial page columns in USA Today, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which is the Pulitzer Publishing Company, the Detroit News. The Detroit News had over about 30 articles there, and a lot of other papers uh, around the country, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, and so on. And so if you are so inclined, if you go to USA Today's uh, website and you go to the bottom, there's an arrow that says more. You know, just click the more, and then that will lead you to another arrow <laughs> that says more. And eventually you will get to their archives. That's where you're going, to the archives, because the current website is only recent material. And so uh, I, uh, you will actually find among the 30 or so articles I did for USA Today's editorial page, there will be about four, four or five that specifically deal with local control and how the feds are trying to, you know, through Goals 2000, it was called back then, the National Education Goals and so forth, uh, try to undermine local control. And then, of course, with the, the Republican, George W. Bush got together with the liberal Democrat, Teddy Kennedy, that was sort of, you know, that was the end right there with No Child Left Behind about uh, 10 years ago. But uh, even during the Clinton years, they were trying to undermine uh, local control back then. And so I had about four columns, uh, four or five columns, saying how, no, 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 we should not do that. We need to maintain local control. And, and uh, I don't just, when I write a column, it's not just, well, gee, I think this would be nice. You know, it's not just an, an opinion. I actually have done a, a, a tremendous amount of research over many, 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 you know, 40 years, and that's why one of the books that Radio Liberty offers is my 200-year uh, education chronology. And you say, oh, 200 years, that's a big book. No, it's only about 135 pages, but it does have a 3,000, roughly 3,000 item index. If you want to get the flow, the flow of where things uh, have come from and where they're going, and I think it's especially useful even for people who are knowledgeable uh, about this. For example... Hold that thought, hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Staten, and suddenly our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we're simply talking about the things that are going on behind the scenes today. And Dr. Cuddy certainly is talking suddenly. Well, go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, right. Uh, so I will get a lot of uh, email. Uh, there's, there's sort of this education network. It's a very good network of, of people, uh, men and women, uh, who are really concerned and up to date about education. And uh, today, the Common Core curriculum, and they're you know emailing each other all over the place, and their organizations uh, being set up. And I think uh, you know one of Dr. Stan's good friends, uh, the the head of uh, the Eagle Forum out in California actually has a very, very good book uh, on the subject about Common Core, what's wrong with it. It's Phyllis Schlafly, and her education reporter, had a, uh, a front-page column in this last month's issue about the, the sort of background of Common Core. 
And uh, what what I do though is I try and reach out to those people, and I tell them, you know, basically, I say, this, "You're right on target. This is a good job you're doing. This is wonderful." And then I sort of add uh, a little but, and it's not a disagreeing but. It's this but you may want to look at the at the 200-year chronology I did to to see how this is just accidental, and here's where it was before and before and before and before and before. And before. Uh, so, for example. Uh, one person was talking about uh, how uh, a very knowledgeable person, a very knowledgeable researcher was saying, well, yeah, look uh, look at this common core. You can go back to uh, the National Education Goals, Goals 2000, school to work. And so I said, well, yeah, and you might want to check the congressional record. Just type in D.L. Cuddy, you know, go on there and search in the congressional record, Congress's website, D.L. Cuddy and Henry Hyde. D.L. Cuddy, Henry, because uh, Congressman Hyde, Placed a couple of my articles in the congressional record of the background of school to work and you know the international implications, the transatlantic agenda, which will help uh, explain that. And so another researcher would go back further and say, well, you know, in the 1970s, I think Turchenko and the Soviet Union said, I said, well, yeah, that's that's true, but you you need to go back a little further. Another one uh, emailed and said. Well, yeah, you got to go back to that Carnegie uh, Social Studies report of 19, I think it was 34. So I said, well, yeah, but <laughs> I said, if you check just before that, that Carnegie report, what you'll find is that uh, John Dewey, in his book, Individualism Old and New, in 1929, this is five years before the Carnegie report, he was saying what we're going to have, and he was the father of progressive education. You go to any school and ask them if they know the name John Dewey. Oh, wonderful man, wonderful father of progressive education. It's great. He's well respected by 99% of the, the teachers. But if you look at that, he says in his book, Individualism, Old and New, he says what we're going to have and what we're about is socialism. He said, you know, we may call it uh, uh, liberalism or democratic liberalism, but it's really going to be socialism. And I said, then you go back before that, the year before, and the December 5, 1928 issue of the New Republic magazine, he's just come back from the Soviet Union. You know, even the Soviets got wise to him and kicked him out of the place because he's messing up their system. It, you know, he went over there to help them, and they thought, oh, good, you know, real real intercollegiate socialist society kind of guy. And But they found that he was messing them up. They, you know, they got they got wise and kicked him out quicker than we did. In fact, we still haven't kicked Dewey as a mouth. Uh, but anyway, he comes back, and it's uh, the December 5, 1928 issue, and he says, this is great. The Bolsheviks are wonderful. They are doing such great things in the Soviet Union. And he goes on and says, they're undermining the church, they're undermining the family, and this is wonderful. <laughs> and after that, of course, the NEA, the National Education Association, Man, do they love this guy? He's their kind of guy, so they make him, you know, an honorary president. You know? And I think it's important for our listeners to understand this is what they're doing in our churches today. This is why they will not allow any teacher to mention creation, because creation indicates there's a God, and the purpose of our educational system is to destroy faith and belief in God and family and country. That's why they took mention of God and the Ten Commandments and and certainly prayer out of our schools. That's why we can't have acknowledge why. Christmas or Easter or celebrate these uh, holidays certainly in our schools. This is why certainly no one is allowed to mention creation in, and that's why they indoctrinate our children in evolution. Why? Because they want to destroy belief in God and then in family and then in country. Why do you think so many of our young people are in revolt today? A public educational system is aimed at destroying the integrity of our nation. And when you understand that it makes sense, and this is why you need to get your children, your grandchildren, out of these government schools and get them into schools where they'll learn about the importance of their individual relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll be back in just a moment. Our guest is, of course, Dr. Dennis Ketty. And we're right here at Radio Liberty. And if you have a question or comment, don't hesitate. Give us a call at one Triple eight two four liberty one triple eight two four liberty or four six four eight two nine five. Well, this is Doctor Stan. Go right ahead, Doctor Cuddy. Okay. Well, uh, picking up on what you uh, just said about evolution and the churches and so on, 
Uh, in that 200-year education chronology that Radio Liberty uh, offers, uh, that, that I wrote, uh, I think around 1973, I put a quote by Sidney Hook, and uh, it's in the Humanist magazine, and he's talking about that. He says, well, we'll get the, the children, uh, not by a frontal attack, but by indirection. He said, by indirection, uh, if, if we get, if we sort of sneak evolution in there, he said, we will get rid of all, he said, Adam and Eve and all those alleged myths of history. That's the way he put it. You know, get rid of Adam and Eve and all those concepts, and then we'll have, you know, evolution. No creation, just evolution. And uh, then, see, once we got the, the youngsters believe in evolution, and man is simply a, an animal, maybe a higher form, he's still an animal, then all kinds of things will open up. You know, abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, you know, why not? Just another, right? That's what we, you know, you might do with some animals. You know, you treat cattle that way, well, you know, Time to breed this and that and cattle. Well, time to die. Well, that's okay. You know, we manage. We manage the population of people just like we manage a population of, you know, horses or cows or something. And there's just, just another form of animal that we will have to manage for the good of the planet and whatever. And so that's the way uh, these elitists look at us. You know, we're, we're just these little peons down here. And so... Uh, what you find is that uh, Sidney Hook would say that, and then about seven years after that, uh, John Dunphy, you'll find this also in that 200-year chronology, uh, they have this essay contest each year, and he, he wins like one of the third-place prizes. And he, in, in his essay, John Dunphy in the Humanist Magazine, talks about how this battle is being waged bet between secular humanism and what he calls the, quote, rotting corpse of Christianity, and the battles in the schools, and he says humanism will emerge triumphant. It'll emerge, re emerge triumphant, and he wins, hooray, you know, the humans say, great, this is our kind of essay, so he wins an award for that. And they're very, very frank, very frank about uh, what their goals are, and, and so that's the, in terms of evolution and, and how, they, how they're using that. Uh, but back to what I was saying, uh, uh, telling this very, very bright researcher that you have to go back before Carnegie's... Hold that thought, hold that thought, Dennis. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about this planned program to use education to destroy the infrastructure of our society, and to convert our children from dope believing in God and family and country to become little internationalists to believe that their parents are outdated, and certainly to do everything they can to destroy their faith in God. This is, of course, why so many of our children come out of high school or out of college as dedicated atheists. It takes them many years to unlearn what they've been indoctrinated in. Oh, they will tell you, oh, this is young people are liberal. That's just the way they are. No at all. Uh, education, the purpose of modern day education is to destroy uh, this country. And basically, Dr. Cuddy has a wonderful book. It's 200 years of quotations on education. We actually have that here at Radio Liberty. You need to get it. Uh, there are thousands of certain quotations from the people who readily admit Education will be used to destroy America. And boy, are they doing a great job of it. And they've convinced us that we are a democracy. We're not a democracy. You can read the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Federalist Papers, constitutions of all of our various states, the, ple the, the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Never will you see the word democracy used other than to decry it. Why? Because, of course, democracies always fail. Plato said that in his, uh, in his Republic, it's certainly written 2,500 years ago. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that Plato said democracies don't work, so why do we have a democracy here? Because they don't want it to work, because they want a dictatorship. This is what it's all about. Why do you think that certainly today... Only 10% of the American people have any confidence in Congress. Congress's rating of approval is 10%. Why don't we understand that basically our Congress has been taken over by people who have no belief in America? And certainly most of what goes on in Washington, D.C. is subversive and violation of the very tenets of the oath that our congressmen have sworn to uphold the Constitution. Most of what goes on in Washington, D.C. is totally unconstitutional. Dr. Cuddy, go right ahead. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> the founders of the country, uh, George Washington and, and the rest of them, deliberately rejected democracy. They said it's uh, really mobocracy uh, because what it what it results in is uh, what they term the tyranny of the majority. Uh, you know that on any given day, if fifty one percent say people would 
brown eyes die than people with brown eyes die. <laughs> so uh, we're actually a constitutional republic. Uh, we're a republic, a republican form of government, but it's a constitutional one. But so you see, ba basically they can say, but basically the people don't vote on these. It's, it's our elected representatives. We have a democratic republic. Ladies and gentlemen, our representatives are voting to give money to people. Do you realize there are over 100 million people are getting water and other type of, of food aid? Over 100 million people in America are getting some sort of free medical, government care, Medicare, Medicaid. And basically, of course, the people then vote for the congressmen who vote to give them these benefits. The only trouble is we can't afford them, the country's going bankrupt, we're headed towards a dictatorship, and the average individual has no idea what's going on. Quickly, let's go to Ron, who, who's calling us from Washington. Ron, does you have a, a question or comment for our guest? Well, I, I found Dr. Cuddy's uh, information very enlightening as far as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the background of all this uh, Common Core. Uh, it's also been called Obama Core. And it's a, it's a, to me, a brazen attempt to uh, literally kidnap our kids by the federal government, uh, to take a, our ability to uh, control the curriculum of our kids away from us and hand it to some three-piece suit out in Washington, D.C. And I'm running for school board, and that's, that's one of the, uh, the issues that I'm running. And I really appreciate some of the information he's given. I called a National Education Association a, a more accurate term if the... Uh, uh, truth and truth and uh, labeling law applied to organizations would be called the Globalist Indoctrination Association. Well, Ron, if I could, uh, for those of you who don't know Ron, I do know him. He's one of our regular callers. He's a, a teacher. And, Ron, I do hope you want to get this uh, cool. Book by Dr. Cuddy. It's, it's, uh, how many uh, quotations are there in there on education, Dr. Cuddy? Uh, well, it's, uh, the, the, the way I calculate it, it's only 135. Uh, pages, but there's 3,000 items in the index, so let me do a quick, uh, quick, uh, let's see, I'm doing this, this will take me about 15 seconds, I'm looking at the page. Uh, well, a couple ten, of thousand, ten, co uh, co yeah, couple uh, thousand quotations anyway. Yeah, it's about uh, 20 or so per page. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine, anything else you want to say, Ron, before we let you go? Well, I think if uh, people ought to have the uh, attitude that their kids are not for sale. It's the only thing you can take to heaven with you on this earth and uh, hand them over to some of these uh, very nefarious organizations is very important. Amen to that. I agree with you totally, and we're going to start coming up with a home program. We're going to start advertising it here in this next week or two, and we hope everybody will think about getting their children and their grandchildren into a home program which doesn't take you a lot of time, but will save their souls. God bless. Thanks very much, Ron. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and... and it's important for these uh, the people who are researching this. Uh, let's say they look at Common Core. Now, somebody uh, emailed me about Lou Gerstner, uh, Jr., who is uh, head of uh, IBM, and he's saying something about Common Core. And I said, well, what you got to understand is 20 or so years ago when an organization called Achieve was beginning, Lou Gerstner was one of six CEOs involved in that, too. And at the time, and I put the quote, I had to mail it to this person, the quote. He said, we are uh, a major employer in this particular state, and therefore we, and we encourage all other companies and corporations to do the same thing. We are going to make our expansion decisions and location decisions based on whether the state goes along with what we have determined the proper national goals of education are. In other words, it's, it's on almost, I don't want to use a bad word, you, you understand what it is that he's basically doing, say do it or else, and, or we won't uh, locate our factory in you know, California or Oregon or wherever. And so uh, this, this attitude of these people go way back, and uh, what I was going to say about uh, the person going back to the conclusion, uh, Carnegie's conclusions report, 1934, if you look just before that, I think 1933 or 32, uh, William Z. Foster was head of the Communist Party of America. And he had a book called Toward Soviet America. And in there, he had a very, very important uh, part about education, how education will be used. He says, well, what we'll do in education is we'll get rid of God, you know, school, prayer, Bible reading, and we'll do it and emphasize science, and science will emphasize evolution, and that'll get rid of creation. And, uh, you know, on and on and on. And sure enough, all the stuff 
pretty much all the stuff that he said they would do to get us to become a Soviet type of country has come to fulfillment today. So his his plan is, you know, here, basically. And so I had, uh, before the break, I was talking about John Dewey, 1929, his book, 1928, how the Bolsheviks were wonderful, undermining the church and the family. And so I was telling these people, but you go back before that, around 1920, and there's a judge, uh, uh, he's a John Hyland, H-Y-L-E-N, he's running for mayor of New York. And I have these old articles, like in the New York Times, 1920, and I put these in the chronology. So you'll find this in my 200 year education chronology. And he says, what we got to do is if I'm elected, you know, they make these platform speeches, if I'm elected, I'm going to get rid of those Rockefeller agents in control of our schools who are trying to make our youth like the, his term is, the coolies in China. And so if you look at today, and school to work and now common core and so forth, they're, they're still trying to do that. Uh, and so I said, well, that's 1920, but you want to go back one more year. And then 1919 was volume three of uh, a series by Arthur Calhoun. Arthur Calhoun, and I put this in my 200-year chronology, and it's sort of the social history of the American family. And he begins by saying, uh, well, the, the, the American family as we know it today it really goes back uh, to the days of savagery, you know, these ind- individual families. No, we don't. Society. Society needs to be in charge of the kids. And he, he goes on and describes how we're going to have socialism. And, uh, you know, here's what we'll have kindergartens, we'll go down to the cradle, you know, we'll get the children at younger, four years old, three years old, two years old, down there, get them out of the home, you know, get them out of the home, get them to the nursery center, and we want the, the women, we want to get those women out into the workforce, and, you know, where does all that come from? Well, that's, I, in, in my books, I put the 1895 Friedrich Engels, who co-authored with Marx the, the Manifesto, he wrote a long, a long uh, article about that. He says, "Yeah, we want to get the women out of the home and into work. You know, give them enticements. You know, more money, respect, all this stuff. Get them out of the home. Why? Well, because we have more workers. Quote, you know, workers of the world unite. That's the communist movement. But also, then we can get the kids. See? He said, "You just give us two generations. That's all we need. Just two generations, and we'll change those, those little kids into little so communists." And I think it's so important people understand. Basically, we're talking about a plan program to get working, to get women working. Why? To get them out of the home so that the children would be more dependent upon the schools, they would right. not have a maternal influence. And basically, they then wanted to condition our children, turn them away from God and from family and country, convert them into this us being citizens of the world. Isn't it wonderful? I mean, we're all working for peace and love, and oh, what a wonderful world we're going to have. And ladies and gentlemen, look at the world they've created. The people that are being slaughtered, as we've slaughtered 100,000 innocent civilians over in Syria. Does anybody really care? I do care about the hundreds of thousands that we slaughtered in Iraq. We went in there because, oh, Saddam Hussein was a terrible guy. You've forgotten we put Saddam Hussein in power in 1979. And you can go up on the Internet. You don't have to believe a word I say. Go up on the Internet and type in Saddam Hussein, CIA assassin in 1959. Saddam Hussein, CIA assassin, 1959. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we taught him. Uh, your government, your tax money taught Saddam Hussein to become assassin. He really wasn't very good back in 59, but he did develop a certain underwrite tutelage until he took power, and we put him in power in 1979. And then we used the fact that he was in, uh, the terrible, terrible individual who had killed all these people so we could go in and kill a lot more civilians. This is not imaginary. This is real and men and women become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. But you, fortunately, we do have access to the Internet. Today, you can check out everything we say. And if you doubt that this is Luciferian, simply go to the Trilateral Commission's website, trilateral.org, 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 and look at their logo. And as you'll see the three sixes, if you look closely, three sixes joined together by an upside-down broken cross. That's what we're really up against. But the average American simply goes along thinking things are going to get better on their own. They're not going to unless you become involved in this battle with Dr. Cuddy and I. We've got Jim calling from West Virginia. Jim, does he have a question or comment? Oh, it's a comment. Yeah, I mean, 
I learned electronics from a 1946-47 correspondence course. I knew what all those parts and pieces did. As I learned the math, I could apply and I could do. I could design work. I could engineer stuff, okay? I took electrical engineering West Virginia University, supposedly the top ten in the nation, in the top ten. And we took a straightforward subject and totally convoluted. The guys who didn't know what was going on didn't know the trees from the leaves from the forest. Ten years older uh, engineers knew what they were doing, and I learned a lot from them. But uh, it's so bad now. I, in the last uh, three years, I run into an engineer who cannot design anything without AutoCAD, a computer program. Just like kids in grade school who can't do math without a calculator. And I bumped into an electrical engineer who didn't know how to use an oscilloscope. So part of deindustrialization. There is a reason why American companies are buying, renting, stealing, hiring engineers from India. Because schematics are a universal language. And I mean to tell you, I don't know where I fell and start learning at this point. I gave all my good books away, but education is that bad. I remember 10 years ago, a kid was taking education courses where government was God and and, and control was king. Okay, but, God bless uh, him. I'm, I'm so fascinated with Dr. Cuddy. God bless. Thanks very much, Jim. We'll go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, there's uh, a... Uh, uh, in, in terms of education, uh, I've mentioned this before, and I've written columns about it, uh, how if you were to go to the mall and you see a group of teenagers, five or six of them, you say, can I ask you a question? And you ask them, are you in high school? Yes. Are you taking uh, physics and calculus? They'll sort of chuckle to each other and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm taking physics because, you know, it's a requirement to get into college. But uh, calculus, no, nah, I don't think so. I'm delaying that. You know, it's, it's sort of hard. I'll delay it. And that's their attitude. But uh, uh, a friend I, I know who was at the university that I went to uh, the other day, he's, he's originally from India, and he went back there. And he says, uh, when I went back there, he said, all of the high school students, uh, they weren't watching, you know, video, playing video games and soap operas. They would get up in the morning, and they would immediately go to, you know, the, the, the news, the financial section, though, to see the world's economy and who was, you know, going down, who was going up, and, and what political price. <laughs> they were they were eager. They were eager uh, to, to have this educational foundation. And then, uh, of course, there's, uh, the, the case, and I've mentioned this before, how in India and China, there are 50 million, 50 million high school students who are taking, uh, now remember, the American students, they're maybe taking physics, but not calculus. In India and China, 50 million of their high school students are taking four years of algebra, four years of geometry, four years of trigonometry, four years of calculus. They're throwing statistics in there and they're integrating all of those at the same time because that's the way you build a building, you know, a little algebra, a little geometry, a little trig, a little calculus. They're also taking four years of biology, four years of chemistry, and four years of physics. Now, who do you think is going to win the future race for, you know, a, a better economy and, you know, more knowledge and more abilities? I mean, who do you think? Well, I'll give our leaders want a mediocre America. They basically, the people in charge, hate America and everything it stands for. Why? Because America one time was a great Christian nation and dominated the world, but no longer. America suddenly has turned away from God. America has turned away from greatness. America is becoming increasingly mediocre, and our next generation of young people are not going to be able to compete effectively in the world uh, economy. And, of course, this is not happening by accident. It's happening happening by a tent. And if you haven't gone into the Common Core curriculum, when we have a, a CD on that, and we have certainly a four CD set, and we have a DVD on Common Core, you need to get it. You need to understand planned mediocrity for your children and grandchildren. Our telephone number, one 24 liberty but go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, so anyway, uh, that, that book I mentioned, uh, 1919, uh, Arthur Calhoun, the Volume 3, uh, that's not just a book. That was a really, really standard book for uh, social worker uh, college students. And so here you have the seeds being instilled, you know, into these college students who would then go forth into, you know, working in schools and social service agencies with this type of philosophy. You know, socialism's the way. Uh, the the family is a uh, throws back to savagery. It's society, the group, uh, which should uh, rule and so forth. So you, you have these uh, seeds going way back, and Common Core is the latest reincarnation of this. It's basically a combination of 
uh, loss of local control, school to work, and outcome-based education all rolled into one bad <laughs> bad apple. They just re, re changed the name to try and trick the public. And ladies and gentlemen, there's an organized effort to dumb down our students, to take away their incentive, to make them mediocre. Our kids are not taking calculus, and, and, and that's one of the major thrusts today of Common Core, is to uh, yeah, certainly not start algebra until a year later, and so they'll not have time for any of this. They want to destroy America from within using the educational program. It's not imaginary, it's real. We are under attack today from within. Well, Dr. Cuddy, you've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Uh, okay. Uh, Charlotte Isabit, who's a, a guest also from time to time on Radio Liberty, has a, a good book with a good, a good title called The Deliberate Dumbing Down, uh, is what it's called. That's what they've done to education. Uh, and she, she goes into a lot of that and gives a very good account of what's been going on. So I would encourage people to, to look at the background because a lot of times, unfortunately, uh, people are enthusiastic in their opposition to Common Core but they, they almost have a sense of this is something that just, just popped up, you know, just popped up. And what you need to understand is it, does, it doesn't just, it's not just popping up. Uh, this has a real track record. It's uh, part of a long-range plan. And uh, as I said, it's, you link all of these things. It, it's bad enough if we had to fight just on the educational front. Uh, but like I said, uh, Detroit's an example where you have to fight on the globalist economic front, and they, they come at you on many, many fronts at the same time and try and wear you down. So you're supposed to get, get you really tired and despondent and so forth, and you're supposed to be turned off and say, well, to heck with them, and I'll just, you know, go watch a ball game or something like that. And so uh, this is a massive, massive plan uh, in my series on mental health, education, social control, I begin the whole thing with a quote by John Rawlings Reef in the Mental Health Journal, that's the title, Mental Health, where he says, we have made a useful attack, attack on two professions, uh, the church and the uh, teaching profession. And now think about that. He's referring to this as an attack on undermining the church and taking over the educational profession because he knows uh, from their perspective, these are two really, really important uh, aspects of our lives that they must control in order to uh, remold us uh, nearer to their heart's desire, as the Fabian Socialists would say. I agree with you totally. So what can we do? What can the average individual do? Well, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that they're sort of getting late. As H.G. Wells said, this thing's going to speed up towards the end. It may even, I'm, I'm a realist. It may even be too late, but we at least need to try you get in touch with each other, you get this material, listen to Radio Liberty, you have to organize. They don't care diddly about you as an individual writing a letter. They have a nice form letter to respond to you. You have to have an org organization in your locality and start there. It's, it's an uphill battle, but if you want to try, that's the place to try first. Amen to that. Well, I guess it's been Dr. Dennis Kelly. We're talking about the very real problems that face America today. And if you're not involved, ladies and gentlemen, then you become part of the problem. Because men and women do become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. And there is an organized effort. These things are not happening by accident. The enemy is not the terrorists or the communists or the fascists. They're right here in America. Dr. Cuddy, thank you so very much for being with us. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. God bless. Okay, fine. Well, I guess it's been Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and certainly we hope that you enjoy his programs as much as we enjoy putting them on. Basically, we carry all of Dr. Cuddy's books. If you've never read his book, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, we have it. We also have his 200 years uh, of quotations on uh, uh, on education, and basically there are about 3,000 quotations there of about this program, to use education to destroy America. And you can get Dr. Cuddy's books, The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, or there's other books by calling 1-800-544-8927. But I specifically recommend his 200 years of, of educational quotations. 200 years of educational quotations. And give us a call at 1-800-544-8927. 
that in case you could like to know about the, the, what they're really doing in our schools today. It's a new program called Common Core. Now, you're never going to hear about this from Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or the other shills for the you know, establishment. They're not, they pretend to be right wing, but they're very well paid. Why do you think they give Rush Limbaugh some 40 or $50 million a year? It's not for revealing the truth, but for concealing it. But he does it so well, and I love to listen to Rush. He's so entertaining. But he's never going to tell you about the Common Core curriculum. And yet this is being introduced across America. We have a four CD set on Common Core. We have a DVD on Common Core. And we even have a book on Common Core. They're all available by calling 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. What is Common Core? Why well, it's the new Common Core curriculum that is being introduced all across America. And its goal is mediocrity, ladies and gentlemen. Mediocrity and the destruction of the educational system, which once was the, the finest in the world, and today it is simply mediocre. And so we do hope that if you're out there will want to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, to understand the forces working behind the scenes today to bring about this one world totalitarian regime, the book Brotherhood of Darkness, and then you need to get my talk on Agenda 21, The Covert Plan. Why do you need it? Well, because we take you into the, with the master plan that's being implemented today. Fortunately, you don't have to accept my word. Agenda 21 is the agenda for the 21st century being implemented by the secret societies and secret groups that control our electoral process, control our corporations, control our banks, control our military, control our educational, and yes, even our churches, and control the media. You need to get the information. You need to find out if it's really true. Agenda 21, the covert plan. An excellent talk, and you'll actually take you into the background, give you the documentation. There's a syllabus that goes with it. it and it's, and you don't have to get the syllabus. If you get it, it's a decreased, pri decreased price. But get the information, at least listen to the talk. Hopefully you'll get the syllabus. Our number 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage is radioliberty.com. You can go there, and certainly you can listen to our Internet programs. There is certainly 24 hours a day. As you know, we do five hours of talk radio every day, and four hours of live talk are available on that website. And then, of course, all of our Certainly our, our archive programs are there for a period of six weeks. We want you to listen to them, but more than that, we want you to get other people to listen. We want you to check out everything we say, and if anything we say isn't true, we want you to call us, and so you can reach us through our 800 number, 1-800-544-8927. I'm not infallible, but we usually, of course, check everything we say multiple times before we put it out over the air. We were involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. Christian civilization is under attack today. And basically, once freedom is lost, it will not be regained. Are you going to join us in this struggle? Or are you going to sit back and say, oh, well, it's not my battle. It is freedom was lost. It will be lost forever. 